Welcome to Washington in Focus, your source for the week's top stories in the state of Washington. I'm Cole Lauterbach, managing editor for the Center Square Newswire Service. This week, we'll be discussing a warning from Washington truckers about adopting California's environmental standards, grim results from an audit into the state's attempt to bring its technology into the current century, Spokane County dealing with some housing investments in the red, and some good news on the front about murder hornets. That's ahead in Washington in Focus. I'm Cole Lauterbach. Knowledge is power, and you deserve to know what happens in your state government. That's why the nonprofit Franklin News Foundation is bringing you straight news journalism through the center square, reporting on state authorities and publishing stories that show where your money goes and who spends it. By supporting the center square, you can track politicians' use of taxpayer money and demand transparency from elected officials. This is how we can equip everyday Americans to hold their government accountable. Become a supporter of Franklin today at franklinnews.org donate. Welcome back to Washington in Focus. I'm Cole Lauterbach. Now, let's jump into the headlines. The state of Washington has agreed to adopt many of California's environmental standards. This includes one that will require many of the big rigs in the state to run on electricity instead of diesel fuel. Now, the state's truckers are saying the timeline to electrify is going to cause chaos for the supply chain. Investigative reporter TJ Martinell covered this grim warning. TJ, give us a rundown of what the requirements will be in the coming years. So essentially what's going to go on is that the state is going to require that truckers uh, sales of trucks in the state, a certain percentage has to be uh, zero emission, which is basically electric. And that percentage will increase over the years. So for and depending on the type of truck, the type of vehicle, the percentage could be starting next year, 7% or as high as 11%. And by 2030, for certain types of drugs, the sales have to be 50%. So half by yeah. that time. And the current percentage is maybe point what? I, it's like, it's almost, I mean, in some cases, there there's some places that are just not selling. They're not selling at all, like not one. And now the association representing truck companies in Washington didn't exactly mince words in their letter to Governor Inslee. Yeah, they were talking about how there's a lot of, pro- the biggest problem is you have to, you can't force someone to buy a truck. I think that that's the the <laughs> key issue is that you cannot force a trucking company to buy a truck that they don't want to buy. And there's a lot of problems with why the sales are not, they're not able to sell the vehicles. And one of them is the lack of infrastructure for charging. Um, the cost of these vehicles, they cost way more than a, a clean diesel uh truck and also they don't get the same distance you know some of these trucks can go from my the 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 zero emission trucks can only go maybe 150 200 miles per charge so if there's not a charging station within that distance and obviously a trucker is not going to want to say hey i'm going to run out of battery juice the moment that i get to the charging station they're going to want to have some wiggle uh, room so that in case anything happens and then they also have to be certain that the charging port's functional and that mm-hmm. it had a, a vandalism, copperware theft, and that they're actually going to get the, the full charge that they need. Uh, so, and they also, some of these trucks don't carry as much in terms of cargo capacity as clean diesel ones. Well, and, and also it, one thing that got me thinking after I'd read your story was the logistical nightmare between not only having to plan to commute between chargers, but also the, thought that if you're a truck driver, federal law requires that you have eight hours of they call bunk time um, per day because, you know, to fight fatigue, we don't need truckers falling asleep and causing massive pileups on the highway. That just adds yet another really, really complicated part of this equation. And also what happens when, you know, if if they do get to 50 percent, what happens to over the road truckers? who are not running, you know, Tacoma to Vancouver. Instead, they're running, say, port of Seattle to uh, Boise, where it, you've, you know, you're not going to see once you're out of the state, even if the state does manage to get these this charging infrastructure set up and reliable and not vandalized. What happens to those over the road truckers once they get out of the state where, you know, Montana is not going to 
build electric infrastructure just because Washington said that those truckers had to. Yeah, what the Washington Trucking Association is worried about is that these trucking companies based in Washington state will simply move to another state and they won't they either won't operate in Washington state or they'll just move to a nearby state that's close enough to where they can operate within Washington state but they're not subject to its laws. Because right. The state can't the state can't mandate that Idaho sells so many zero emission trucks and they also can't say hey you can't bring your trucks over into Washington state unless they're zero emissions. That's that they're not they not well, they might. I mean, in that regard, they do have the ability because you have to, as a commercial truck uh, owner, you do have to have a license to haul and, you know, in specific states. If you look at if you're driving on the highway and you see a truck driving by, uh, oftentimes by the driver's side door, you'll see those stickers, uh, the hologra- holographic stickers that have the state, um, it, you know, the state shape and a logo that says Washington, California, Oregon on it that that is a potential um, way to gatekeep on that, but you're right. I mean, I mean, it, it's, I do, I do think that there's something to the thought of, well, if you're going to make me buy these electric vehicles, do you know, these electric trucks and present all these logistical nightmares and extra cost, I'm just going to incorporate in Idaho. Uh, I'm going to incorporate in another state and then I'll still haul, um, you know, in your state back and forth, I'll get the license, but I'm certainly not going to have to overhaul my entire fleet if that is the case. And now this is this all comes from California, right, TJ? So what the trucking company said was, listen, Washington is not California, right? They've had a decades start on building up this infrastructure. Right. And that's the interesting thing is that the state is not just pursuing a this this policy of mandating that there be a certain percentage of electric vehicle sales it's the the exact specifics of the policy are not even being set by washington state they're being set by california based on california's own unique circumstances so you know they're the interesting thing is the association the trucking association isn't asking them to end the program entirely they're simply saying that it shouldn't be linked to california it should be linked to what's logistically possible in washington state because the the fear from the association is that this is going to create massive supply chain issues because truckers just won't operate in certain areas and it's going to be impossible to get goods and services to move around and from an economic uh, standpoint it's it, this is kind of like cutting off the blood supply to a certain part of your body if you right. it's just how the same way blood through, flows through the body truckers flow goods and services uh for the most part throughout the state and yeah, you do have trains, but those trains don't deliver your food to Safeway or your, your <laughs> right. they, they have to, be, they have, most of the time they, at some point they are being moved by a truck. Well, and what did Inslee's office say? Inslee's office said that they are looking, they haven't fully prepared a response yet, but they are not, it doesn't seem like they're going to change their mind, but they are going to try to work with them. Uh, to achieve compliance, including credits or uh, credit sharing or something like that. And they're also trying to build uh, charging infrastructure along Interstate 5. Uh, so, but at the same time, that's I-5. Uh, but truckers don't just operate on I-5. They operate on I-90. They operate on state highways throughout the state. And, you know, they obviously in Spokane and other places that it's not just the main corridors there's and we've discussed this before there are certain areas where there are no electric vehicle charging stations for a significant uh, for a significant area the entire regions of the state may not have an electric vehicle so or charging port so how is a trucker going to operate there right now yeah, I, I wonder if instead of the, the you know long haul uh trucks they focus on trying to get like the the ltl the the less than load the short distance <laughs> trucks to be all evs yeah and this is going to actually raise if that happens it's going to raise the cost of goods in rural areas especially in areas where they are not near an interstate uh right. you, because it's just it's is more uh financially practical for truckers to operate and deliver goods and services on the state high interstate highways. But if they have to go to these kind of remote places already, it's going to cost more 
for those same goods, the prices are going to be higher. If they have to deliver them in less efficient uh, capacity, that's going to raise the prices even more and make it more costly for people in rural areas to buy stuff. Ah, unintended consequences. They're the best, aren't they? Thank you, TJ. Appreciate it. Good story. Despite Washington being home to some of the biggest names in technology, many states are operating with 1960s era computer systems. A massive project to bring those systems up to date is turning out to be more expensive and time consuming than state officials had originally thought. Capital correspondent Carlene Johnson sifted through these findings from a new audit report. Carlene, what'd you find? Yeah, so a little background first, uh, I think is important. So to, to make this upgrade, the state legislature established, um, basically a mini agency called One Washington. And so mm-hmm. that's the group that will figure out how to replace this aging software with a, a cloud-based system. So bring it up to date. And the new system is called Workday. So, um, the state's IT project dashboard shows, get this drum roll plan cost for this new system, $465 million. Wow. That's yeah. a big, big number for a <laughs> bunch of computers. Now what's it, it apparently too, it's, it's running into a lot of, um, snags, right? What's the holdup then? Yeah, so the plan was already kind of phase this in right over several years because it involves the transfer of um, billions of dollars in budget data for more than a 100 state agencies. And this is the data um, that feeds what the, the current system is called the Agency Financial Reporting System or <clears throat> AFRS as they refer to it. So that's the central hub for everything accounting in state government. So for a idea of how this works every single month the state these 100 or so state agencies processes through this AFR system 4.3 billion dollars in payments so there's a lot of transactions that are taking place and the launch of this workday system though cole already three years behind so it's like okay we got to upgrade our system let's create the state agency to do it here's the new system that we're going to do it's going to take a lot to do it and then boom we're three years behind this thing was going to go live june 2022 now july 2025 but this new audit uh state auditor's office says you're probably not going to be able to launch on that date you're way behind already now i wonder if COVID had a hand at that Absolutely. Yeah. And I spoke to uh, Patrick Anderson, senior performance auditor at the state auditor's office. And he said, yeah, one of the main reasons this thing is so far behind is staff turnover. And it's been a huge undertaking. Right. And so you have all these people in positions of authority They're like, OK, you're going to handle this part of the project. You're going to handle that part of the project. Those people a lot of them left state agencies during COVID, whether that was over vaccine mandates or whatever, right? People just got tired of their jobs during COVID and yeah. quit and, and decided they wanted to do something else. Um, that has continued to be a huge problem. So you're investing all of this money, effort, energy, time into training people up on how to implement this new system. And then you got massive turnover. So that has been the, according to this, this performance audit, that has been the main issue in delays on this over and over again. They're having to train a new person, a new point person. Um, but you know, the auditor is saying, Hey, you got nearly half a billion dollar taxpayer dollars invested right. in this undertaking. So, you know, they're saying, uh, uh-uh, time out right now before you even try to have a you know launch date of of july 2025 we don't think you're going to get there and you've already wasted so much time and money so it's very unusual for them to get involved at this point and to say "Uh uh-uh you know raising the red flag at this point um but they felt it you know responsibility on the auditor's office to get involved now i make sense that they would get involved now i mean i I, and i like this idea because I, i initially saw that too in your story you know to say that you know they're auditing a program that's just not even out yet it's still in the planning <laughs> phases i honestly like that i think that there should be more of it and i think that if we had some diligent auditors looking into programs and, and infrastructure projects 
maybe California would have a light rail system by now. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, that's, uh, that's a good comparison. First, I, I think you're right. And I, I think that that was one of the things that um, Patrick Anderson, the performance auditor at SAO that I spoke with, he said, you know, it is unusual for us to sort of get in the middle and go, ah, time out now before you've even launched. But right. they feel responsible. This is a boatload of money. And right. they're also concerned, too, because think about this. The auditor's office is the one that often looks into all these state agencies, right, and makes sure that they're doing the right thing. That's individually. So now they're going, wait a minute, you guys are going to combine all of this into this new, you know, workday system. You don't have a clue what you're doing. Turnover is a huge problem. And ultimately, this could impact the state's credit rating. Bond ratings, right? Oh, huge interesting. Issue. Wow. So, so you've got massive implications there. That would make a half a billion dollars look like pocket change exactly, if they can't, exactly. if they have to pay a higher interest rate on a 30 year uh, bond, um, that would be exponentially uh, more uh, consequential. Great story, Carlene. Thank you. Spokane County has invested in a handful of properties around the county and housed low-income residents there. The structures were funded primarily by loans from the county. Now, while some appear to be doing well, others are coming back to county officials saying that they can't make their debt payments. Eastern Washington reporter Tim Clouser had this story. Tim, how deep is the county in on these investments? Yeah, Cole, the county has invested nearly $10 million across um, all of its subsidized units throughout the county. And these developments are scattered around the county um, and are only partially affordable housing. So they earmark several units at an affordable rate for X amount of years. And for most of these projects, the county provided loans ranging from as little as $360,000 to Two million, um, some including grant funding as well. And like you mentioned, some of them are doing fine and making payments while remaining profitable, um, but others are struggling. Yeah. What's the issue there? Yeah. So the providers say that um, just given the current climate, they're unable to make payments on the loans due to increased costs and insurance rates. They're saying mm-hmm. that they could continue as is, uh, but they're just going to sink further and further into debt, uh, especially under the added weight of interest. Now, the, so they're coming to the county and they're asking for what specifically? Yeah, so they want to adjust the the their loan agreement. So two of the providers uh, asked the county to reduce their interest rates to zero percent, uh, while promising that they would continue to make payments on the debt. So um, that prevents them from going further into the hole while still getting the county uh, their money back. Besides that interest, while. Um, if the county did reduce those interest rates to zero, it would mean a loss of about $425,000 in future interest revenue to the county. That would be over the course of about 25 years. So it sounds like a big number, but stretched out, not so much. Um, but one of those two developments uh, is still profitable to bring in the county about uh, $315,000 in added value. Um, the other mm-hmm. one, however, which received a $1.25 million loan, uh, that one's heading in for a $77,000 loss. But that's n- nothing really compared to the third development that once it's uh, loan adjusted. Uh, that one received a loan of about $1.65 million, um, but has hardly made any payments at all um, due to the amount of money it's bringing in. So it wants its loan forgiven altogether. And if the county, county does so, Uh, It would mean a loss of over $1 million alone for that development. But when combined with the other loss, $1.15 million. I mean, when I can't, if if I went to my bank that has the mortgage on my house and said, listen, I'm not I'm not making enough money. Um, I I can't pay my debts here. I I mean, you know, it's Spokane is like Spokane County is like the friendliest bank on the planet because uh, I mean, the bank would own my house within two months and be auctioning it off to recoup some of that lost value. Uh, Is that option on the table here? Uh, it doesn't seem like the county is interested in that. I mean, they do have an issue on their hands here uh, with the loans and them not being able to make payments. But at the same time, Spokane County is around 30,000 units short um, for housing right. uh, and it needs those. And these developments, um, a lot of them have lots of people in them already. So foreclosing, 
um, getting rid of those properties, it would it could create an entirely new problem in itself on top of the affordable housing crisis. Um, so they're really interested in uh, keeping these developments afloat, uh, changing the loan terms um, and letting them proceed, uh, even the development that they're considering for giving the forgiving the loan altogether, um, they might have their loan forgiven and then just proceed with the service, even though it took such a loss. Wow. Well, I'll be fascinated to see what uh, the decision is on those properties there in Spokane County. Thank you, Tim. Good story. I know it's painful, but I want you to try and recall the months leading up to the COVID-19 pandemic. In Washington, the headline was murder hornets invading the Pacific Northwest. The state and federal government took big steps to make sure they hunted down these little balls of nightmare fuel. And as Washington editor Brett Davis reported this week, it seems to be working. Brett, how are we doing in the Great Hornet War? Well, I'd just like to go on record as saying this is as close as I'll ever get to being a war correspondent. (laughs) <laughs> reporting on the Great yes. Hornet War. So, but seriously, uh, there's a cautious optimism from the Washington State Department of Agriculture that the northern giant hornet, that's the preferred name now, okay. has been eradicated from the evergreen state. But that's not official yet. Uh, the Department of Agriculture says the state must go three years without detection to meet the regulatory definition of eradication. Uh, there have been no confirmed sightings of the Hornet since late summer of 2021 when four nests were found uh, and destroyed in Whatcom County in northern Washington state near the Canadian border. Uh, hmm. I talked to uh, Carla Salp, hope I'm not mispronouncing her name, a communication consultant with the Department of Agriculture. And she said, no, giant hornets have been detected this year, but it's still early in the season. Uh, giant right. hornet season here in Washington runs from July through November. So she says by the end of the year, when all the trapping is completed and all the traps are checked, officials will know for sure if they can declare the the giant hornet eradicated from Washington state. Right. So that means basically it's not to say that there could still be some out there. Washington is a very big state, but it's they're saying at this point they're pretty close to, you know, vision zero in terms of, you know, these uh, hornets. Right. At least they want people to keep an eye out for them. Right. So describe these little monsters uh, well, for somebody really who little. might not have seen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they're, That's... they're hard to miss. They're, uh, yeah. they're the world's largest hornet species. They measure up to two inches in length and have a wingspan of up to three inches. Uh, oh. They have a, a yellow to orange head, a black thorax, and a black and orange and yellow striped abdomen. Uh, and here's the, maybe the important part. The northern giant hornet has a quarter of an inch long stinger. Uh, they're known for their aggression and ability to kill bees and other hornet species. Uh, a small group of northern giant hornets, they can, in a matter of hours, kill an entire honeybee hive. And that's what has uh, authorities in Washington concerned because honeybees, you know, they uh, yeah. pollinate many of the crops in Washington's multi billion dollar agricultural industry. So officials don't want to let the bee or the hornet, I should say, get a foothold in Washington. Right. And have you ever seen one of these things in person? I've not seen one in person. Thank God. Okay. (laughs) I imagine if one landed on me, I would know. (laughs) I've seen a dead one um, in a in a glass case, and it was even just completely encased. It was terrifying. And, uh, you know, looking that stinger is nothing to laugh at. And people die. From these right. in Japan, all the all yeah, every year, right? So, so the the good news is that these hefty hornets they rarely attack people unless provoked. I'm not sure why you'd want to provoke them, but uh, you know, <laughs> their repeated powerful stings from the insect or multiple insects can actually cripple or even kill a person. And as you alluded to, you know, up to 50 people a year die in Japan from the from the murder hornets. I guess it's appropriate to call them that in this case. I don't want to offend the murder hornets. Right. I will call them whatever <laughs> pronoun they want. I, I don't. I do not mind. That's fine. Do not offend the hornets. One thing, though. Oh, uh, Brett, this in in Asia where these you know hornets have been around marauding honeybee hives for centuries, they have a crazy response. Right. So they they've developed an unusual defense. Uh, they'll form a ball around the hornets and vibrate their flight muscles to produce heat. And we're we're talking about a lot of heat. The vibration can raise the temperature inside the ball to up to 115 degrees Fahrenheit, which basically cooks the hornet. It also denies the hornet oxygen, which, you know, helps in its demise. So apparently this whole process takes about an hour. This wasn't included in my story, but just a little aside, the, the science nerd in me is impressed with this. 
<laughs> I, 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 and I, it's like, you have to wonder it really. It's it, like in terms of an evolutionary response, where like, if they checked the, the temperature and you know, how did they guess this? And who was the first group of honeybees <laughs> to say, you know, let's go towards this guy instead. It's just See that it, giant it was, ball of bees and hornets. You run toward that. Yes. Here's your exactly. tiny thermometer. Uh, yes. Look at <laughs> look at this thing with a stinger as long as my body. Let's go towards it and shake. Uh, it is just such a fascinating thing to me. Bees just fascinate me in, in general, even though I am deathly allergic to them. But uh, great story. Good to hear some good news out of the Pacific right. Northwest. Thank you, uh, Brett. And a big thank you to our journalists for sharing their stories. Stay up to date with these and more at thecentersquare.com. I'm Cole Lauterbach. And until next time, this has been Washington in Focus.